Chaz Princeton, otherwise known as the Chaz, was a spoiled rich kid who believed that he was better than everyone else, but was especially arrogant towards his main rival, Jaded Yuki. But over time, and after many humiliating defeats, Chaz realized that it was better to carve out his own path in life rather than rely on his status. Which was a change that brought him out of Jaden's shadow and made him a crowd favorite who constantly received thunderous applause. So today we're going to look at the Chaz's most important cards, how they let him Chaz it up, and whether or not they'd give him 1, 10, 100, or 1000 wins in the actual TCG. Then in the number 10 spot, we have the Ring of Destruction, an incredibly reckless trap card, strangely enough, showed off Chaz's softer side. Now, Ring's actual effect is pretty brutal, because it lets you target a face-up monster your opponent controls whose attack is less than or equal to their life points and destroys it. Then you take damage equal to that monster's attack in order to inflict the same damage to your opponent. But Chaz used the same version of the card as Kaiba, its pre errata form, which could target any monster during either player's turn, and both players had to take the damage at the same time. The way Kaiba used Ring was to maximize its brutality to his opponents while minimizing the damage himself with the use of Ring of Defense showcasing his tactical genius. And Chaz actually echoed this genius as he performed the same combo in his duels against the North Academy students, where he used Ring on his own powered up panda to inflict over 4,000 damage to his opponents, while protecting himself with Ring of Defense. But Chaz wasn't as reliant on this combo as Kaiba, and would just use Ring on its own, which ended up inflicting burn damage to both players, and was a fairly important aspect of Chaz's love duel against Alexis. In this duel, Chaz had been encouraged by Atticus to make his romantic feelings known through a duel, and work together on a deck so that Chaz would show his love. And a lot of the new inclusions seemed like pretty strange choices, with the likes of Love Letter and Dramatic Crossroads, and he even made some crucial misplays purely out of love. But Ring of Destruction was actually an amazing choice for his strategy, as not only did it destroy Blade or Skater, the damage both players took was, according to Atticus, symbolic of the pain that lovers share between one another. And, funnily enough, this was actually the main way of using Ring of Destruction in the actual game, rather than Kaiba's patented combo. But not because Ring was a symbol of love, quite the opposite actually, as it was a way to put your opponent at a disadvantage by removing their monsters from the field, and sometimes even end the game outright with its burn. And even if your opponent is doing their best to play around it, as you could have just summoned your own high attack monster and destroyed it to finish your opponent off, like how Chaz did in his duel against the North Academy students, that's not the only way that Ring can end a game. Because if you happen to be in a losing position, you can use the classic version of Ring to force a draw between you and your opponent, since the original version burned players at the exact same time. These factors combined to make Ring an astonishing tool in the early days of the game, and a staple that saw use in a ton of different decks until it was subsequently banned and spent a long time through the limited list up until its eventual errata, which nerfed Ring of Destruction into the ground by making it more awkward to use with its new activation requirements, while also guaranteeing that its user takes the damage first, preventing games from ending in a draw as a result. This once legendary card no longer sees much success in the modern day. Still, if you want to mirror the anime, there are definitely certain strategies that can take advantage of Ring in the same way that Chaz did, but you have to be as willing as he was to share the pain. And today's video is brought to you by Factor. Factor is a meal planning service that sends you complete meals. All you have to do is just heat them up and you're good to go. Right now, work has been super stressful and time consuming. So having Factor to save time on meal prep, cooking, or shopping has been great. Factor is so convenient that it cuts out the excess of prepping or planning, so meals come together in minutes taking the guesswork out of what needs to be made for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. On top of being super convenient, Factor also allows me to find meals that fit my current diet. With meal prep options for keto, calorie smart, vegan, and vegetarian, and more than 27 plus meal options each week, there's something for everyone. Meal plans range from 4 to 18 meals per week, and you can add more or reduce the number depending on your specific needs. You can easily modify food preferences and skip a week if needed. Personally for me, I'm looking for calorie smart meals, like this grilled chicken and browned butter Yukon mash to help me keep me on track. Factor meals are an essential part of my routine, providing me the food I need to accomplish my goals and the convenience to get all my work done. If you want to give it a try, use my link or go to gofactor75.com and use the code pogdualoctober 50 for 50% off your first box. Click the link in the description or scan the QR code on your phone. Hit me up on Twitter once you give it a try and let me know what you think. Smash into the number 9 are Magical Mallet and Reload. Two cards that let Chaz mulligan his hand so that he can guarantee he'd drawn to his best cards. Both Mallet and Reload let you shuffle cards of your hand back into your deck and then draw the same number you put back. With the only difference between the two cards being that Reload is a quick play spell that requires you to shuffle back every card in your hand, while Mallet is a normal spell that lets you pick and choose what you return. Despite their differences though, both of these cards were features of Chaz's decks that he would use to unbreak his hand during multiple points of the series. Magical Mallet, for example, was actually a rare card that had been gifted to Chaz by Dr. Crowler 
who hoped that he would use it to make Jaden fail his tests, and he actually ended up using the card twice within the same turn to turbo out VWXYZ Dragon Catapult Cannon. Meanwhile, Reload was only ever used by Chaz while trapped by his visions of darkness. Within these illusions, Chaz was a pro duelist who had never won a sanctioned duel with his game being his last chance at proving himself. He and his opponent were down to the last few life points, and it was Chaz's turn. So all he needed was a strong normal summon to win the duel and reclaim his glory, only for that draw to be Ojama Yellow, who had zero attack points. But Chaz had a second card in hand, Reload, which gave him a choice. Either he could set Ojama Yellow to the field to survive an extra turn, or he could use Reload to shuffle back Yellow to hope for a new monster to finish off the duel. And Chaz chose both. You see, the visions made by Darkness played on Chaz's negative emotions and his fear of failure by showing him that no matter what choice he made, he would never succeed. Because if Chaz chose to set Ojama Yellow, his opponent would draw a monster with a piercing effect. And if he used Reload, then the card he'd end up drawing would be Level Up, bricking him since now he didn't have a monster to defend himself. Chaz had to repeat this hell over and over until he eventually chose to cheat. And he was immediately caught, allowing for the darkness in his heart to fully take over his mind. At least until Jaden managed to push back Night Shroud and inspire his friends to continue to fight. The sad thing is, cards like Reload might lead you to the same fate in the actual game. Mulligans are conceptually quite strong, and feature in a lot of other card games as a mechanic to ensure both players don't brick. Yu-Gi-Oh, however, doesn't have mulligans built in as a mechanic, and is instead reliant on cards like Reload and Mallet to refresh your hand. However, these cards are unreliable and can't guarantee they'll show up to change your hand if you happen to brick. And even if you do draw them, there's a chance that the new hand you get is just as unplayable. As a result, most strategies would rather play more engine pieces and starter cards that would increase the chances of having a playable hand, rather than wasting a card with a mulligan. However, a couple of strategies have managed to make use of either mallet or reload with the likes of Magical Explosion and Spellbook decks using both because of the advantage they gain from the spell cards. With mallet and reload not only allowing these decks to unbrick their hands, but also bringing them closer to their particular win condition. Thankfully, the powers of darkness aren't too strong in the TCG, so you'll rarely have to rely on mallet or reload to save you from hell. But if you do, you'll have to pray that your luck is a lot better than Chaz's if you need to win a duel with him. And at number 8 is Masked Dragon, an amazing support card for Chaz's armed dragon strategy. And that's because Masked Dragon lets you special summon any dragon monster from your deck when it's destroyed by battle, so as long as that monster has 1500 or less attack. Which makes it excellent for Chaz's armed dragons, as he could use his effect to summon at armed dragon level 3 and begin leveling up all the way into level 7 and level 10. But notably, Mass Dragon itself is also a dragon with less than 1500 attack, so it can summon another copy of itself. Which is exactly what Chaz did in his final duel in the series against Aster Phoenix, where Chaz crashed his own Mass Dragon with Diamond Dude to ensure they were both destroyed by battle, which then allowed Chaz to summon a second copy to attack again and deal with Aster's Dread Servant. Then, when this second copy was destroyed, he summoned a third copy, and when that Mass Dragon was destroyed, finally he summoned out level 3, which began Chaz's climb into level 10, a monster so strong it can compete with Destiny and Dragon, and helped Chaz win the duel, so in a way, Mass Dragon represents the shining future Chaz had as a pro. But it also represents a potentially ruinous path as well. As in Darkness's world, when Chaz was driven to cheat after so many losses, the card he ended up drawing was Mass Dragon, which would have allowed him to win the duel at the cost of his pride if he hadn't been caught. Thankfully, in the TCG, Mass Dragon only represents a good future because it actually is a pretty solid recruiter. Now, in the modern era, recruiters like Mass Dragon aren't used much anymore because they're very slow and unreliable, and most decks prefer cards that can special summon from the deck immediately without relying on the battle phase. But in the past, cards like Mystic Tomato, Mother Grizzly, and even Mass Dragon were staples that gave you easy access to some of the best cards that were sleeping within your deck. The most popular of these recruiters was Mystic Tomato because of the huge pool of powerful dark monsters it could summon. But Mass Dragon was also a useful staple in dragon strategies as the game had a lot of great monsters, and getting easy access to them could put you at a huge advantage. In fact, the monsters you could summon were so strong that often Chaz's move of crashing his unmasked dragon was actually worth it as it gave you immediate access to these powerful monsters at the cost of a few life points. And so it's cool to see that Mass Dragon's hidden potential has actually been unlocked in the TCG, and for similar reasons to why Chaz used it, while showcasing his potential as a Duel Academy graduate and pro duelist. Returning to the number 10 spot is Return from the Different Dimension, a card that proved that Chaz could work his way up from the bottom of the barrel. Likewise, even if a card is in the banished pile, Return proves that they can work their way back, as by paying half of your life points you can special summon as many of your banished monsters as possible. But, during the end phase of the turn, the monster you summon will be banished once more. Now, technically, Return wasn't part of Chaz's usual strategy. In fact, most of his original Cathodia deck had actually been destroyed by water damage when he tried to leave Duel Academy for good after his humiliating defeat to Bastion. 
But after almost drowning, Chaz met a strange figure who guided him to North Academy. The only issue was that in order to enter the school, you had to have a 40 card deck. So Chaz had to assemble a new strategy by foraging and performing death to find stunts to form a new deck, with Return for the Different Dimension being one of those cards. And it ended up being a vile pickup. You see, when Chaz first entered the school, he was forced into initiation to determine where he ranked, and moved his way up from the very bottom, defeating every single duelist until he faced the final boss of the school. Despite how low Chaz thought of himself, he exuded confidence in this duel and managed to completely outsmart the Tsar, who walked right into Chaz's trap by dealing 3000 damage to him. This let Chaz use Infernal Tempest to banish every monster from both players' decks, which seemed like a strange move at first, but it was a genius ploy as after clearing Tsar's monster in the field, Chaz then used Return to bring back all five of his banished monsters and immediately OTK the Tsar, establishing him as North Academy's new number one student. And in the TCG, Return for the Different Dimension holds a similar capability. A lot of strong decks throughout Yu-Gi-Oh's history have needed to banish cards in some way in order to use their most powerful monsters, from the likes of Dark Armed Dragon who could banish dark monsters to pop cards, to Chaos Monsters and Dragon Rulers that to banish monsters with specific attributes and types to bring themselves out. And it's within these strategies where Return excelled, as it gave these decks a way to recur their banished monsters so they could be used again. You see, it's usually pretty common to see a deck using the graveyard as a resource in some way, but it's considerably more niche and much more difficult to use the banished pile in a similar way. But cards like Return opened up that resource and gave any deck that banishes access to an amazing turnaround tool. What Return would be used for varies on the era, with its earliest uses taking advantage of the individual strength of monsters summoned and as an OTK tool to swiftly put up an end to an opponent. But during the Dragon Ruler era, we got to see how busted Return truly was, as instead of just being an OTK tool, the monsters summoned by Return could be used as materials for extra deck summons, which gave you the chance to rebuild into an impressive board off of a single card. It's for all of these reasons that Return was eventually banned as the way Chaz used the card ended up being just too strong for TCG use. So it's no wonder that this was the card that allowed him to return to the top of the pecking order. Spelling out Doom at number 6 is VWXYZ Dragon Cannibal Cannon, the upgraded form of Seto Kaiba's XYZ Dragon Cannon. Cannibal Cannon is actually a fusion of the original XYZ boss monster and VW Tiger Jet, a combination of two new light machine monsters that were unique to Chaz's arsenal. Like its weaker counterparts, you don't actually use polymerization to summon this card, because instead you have to banish its materials from the field to perform a contact fusion. And because it's an even stronger version of XYZ, Catapult Cannon has a similar but better effect, which lets you discard a card to banish any opponent's card, and even has an extra effect that lets you change the battle position of a monster that this card attacks. This meant that no one was safe from Catapult Cannon's onslaught, a fact that Jaden Yuki learned the hard way during his field test against Chaz, where it almost gave Chaz a victory against the Slifer Slacker thanks to its powerful removal effect. However, the thing that made Dragon Catapult Cannon so formidable was Chaz's skill. A lesser duelist would have struggled to bring out such a complicated mech, but Chaz often found a way to bring it out during the early stages of a duel, and even summoned it during his very first duel against Adrian Gecko, where it seemed almost unstoppable, especially when paired with Hyper Coat, which not only boosted its attack stat, but made it completely unaffected by all card effects. Unfortunately though, very few duelists in the TCG can claim to have Chaz's skill set as most people have struggled to make use of Dragon Catapult Cannon. Its removal effect is really strong since it can deal with any card in the field and even banishes it, dodging destruction protection, and preventing any graveyard effects which makes it a solid upgrade from its XYZ's effects. But it's a really difficult monster to summon, even when compared to XYZ Dragon Cannon, as VWXYZ needs 5 specific monsters to hit the field so they can be turned into its fusion components, but these monsters don't have any effects to make the swarming easier. Now, there are a few cards in the modern era that support unions and make the likes of Catapult Cannon easier to bring out, but it's pretty hard to bring out as both X-Head Cannon and V-Tiger Jet aren't union monsters, so they don't benefit from this new support. Thankfully though, the VWXYZ monsters have a sister series of union monsters known as the ABC monsters, who can contact fuse into ABC Dragon Buster, an incredibly powerful boss monster with a similarly strong removal effect that can be used during either player's turn at quick effect speed, and an ability to tag out into its components. And as a result, ABC-focused strategies have been a competitively viable deck for years, and constantly evolve and adapt into new variants to suit different metas, including Ojama ABC, a deck that takes advantage of Ojama simulation to easily bring out all three components of this excellent boss monster. And so, while Chaz and Kaiba's main mechs have never really seen too much success, it's very cool that their concepts are kept alive in the modern day through ABC strategies, and their synergy with Ojama specifically allows you to Chaz it up against even the toughest meta opponents. And giving life to the number 5 spot is Chaos Necromancer, 
a card that served as evidence that Chaz could carve his own path in life and didn't need to rely on the help of his family. Now, Necromancer has an interesting effect that allows it to gain attack equal to the number of your monsters in your graveyard, which could potentially turn it into a powerful beat stick. But with no cards in the grave, Necromancer is a pitiful monster, with zero attack and defense, which made it useless to most duelists. But the Chaz isn't most duelists, a fact that he proved to his brothers. You see, the Princeton brothers had hoped that Chaz would rule over the dueling world so their family could exert their influence across the globe. But because of Chaz's many losses and humiliations, he's been deemed a failure by his brothers. So they took matters into their own hands and attempted to gain power over the world of duel monsters by buying Duel Academy from its current owner, Seto Kaiba. Kaiba isn't a man that can be bought with money, so instead, the Princeton brothers proposed a duel for the Academy, to which Kaiba agreed and stated that any duelist from his school could beat them. And the student that the Princeton brothers chose to face was their own brother, Chaz, who was forced to duel the stipulation that disallowed him from using any monsters with 500 or more attack to make it fair for his less experienced brothers. Chaz didn't shy away from this challenge. In fact, he went up it even further by only playing monsters with zero attack. These monsters were the bottom of the barrel, the worst of the worst. Cards deemed so terrible by the people that played them, they threw them down a well to never be seen again. At least until Chaz came and rescued those lost spirits so he could use them in his duel against his brother, whose deck was made up of extremely rare and powerful dragon monsters. But despite being at a disadvantage, Chaz crushed his brothers with an OTK consisting of the reunited Ojama trio and the power of Chaos Necromancer, which now had an absurd 3300 attack which won Chaz the duel, saving Duel Academy and showing Chaz's brothers that he wasn't a failure that he thought he was. In the TCG though, Chaos Necromancer holds a similar status to its anime counterpart. It's not a good card, and has never seen any competitive success whatsoever. But this duel managed to prove one thing, that even the weakest cards in the game can be a genuine threat with the right duelist using them. Now, there are definitely a lot of powerful monsters with zero attack in Yu-Gi-Oh, but even beyond stats, cards that a lot of people think are useless can have a lot of hidden utility that most people can't see. And this utility could be anything, from an enabler for cards like Small World to being a necessary engine piece, to even being a staple whose effects can counter one of the best decks of the format. Essentially, even if a card has never had a competitive spotlight, Yu-Gi-Oh! was a game centered around innovation, so those previously useless cards might just be the secret to solving a format. Chaos Necromancer might not be a good card right now, but one day there may even be a deck centered around it, just like how Grand Maju, a similar card that gains attack based on banished monsters, ended up seeing solid success in the modern day purely by being a strong beat stick. And in a way, that represents Chaz perfectly. He was deemed a terrible duelist by his brothers but through sure determination, managed to prove that he was worthy of their respect. So if there's ever a card you're tempted to write off, just remember that even the worst monsters or effects out there could be a secret powerhouse. And shining into number 4 is White Veil, the calling card of the Society of Light. And that makes sense as White Veil envelops the monsters it's equipped to with a shiny glow that staves off the effects of spell and trap cards. Because if the monster is equipped to battles, it prevents your opponent from activating back row until the end of the damage step, and the moment that monster attacks, face up back row control by your opponent also have their effects negated until the end of the damage step. But that's not all, as if the monster White Veil is equipped to destroys a monster by battle, you get to destroy all spell and trap cards your opponent controls. However, White Veil also comes with a small but noticeable downside, as if it ever leaves the field while face up in the spell and trap card zone, you take 3000 damage. This made White Veil an intense card that gave its wielder a huge advantage, as it made any battle phase oriented back row entirely useless. So it only made sense for Sartorius to gift this card to his most trusted members, with Chaz Princeton being the first to receive it as he was the first person Duel Academy brought under the Light of Destruction's influence. And at first, it didn't seem like the new Chaz was a legitimate threat, but as time passed, he grew comfortable in his new role and even took over the entirety of the Obelisk Blue Dorm, with each win bringing another student under the control of Light until Obelisk Blue was painted white. Now, Chaz hadn't been Sartorius' first pick to spearhead the society, but he had shown that he was capable as a servant, and one who almost managed to induct every student in the school into the society, with the only exceptions being Jaden and his friends. But not everyone was so lucky, as when Alexis dueled Chaz to defend the honor of Obelisk Blue, Chaz not only forced Alexis into a desperate position by summoning Armed Dragon level 10, he also prevented Alexis from ending the duel in a draw with the effect of White Veil, which allowed Chaz to attack and destroy Cyber Angel Dakini without the interference of Double Passe and caused Alexis to fall under the control of Light. But in the TCG, the Society of Light would have never stood a chance. White Veil is an interesting card because it can invalidate a lot of battle traps, and the fact that it can clear away an opponent's entire back row is an amazing effect. 
and the best part is that it's generic, so any monster can be protected by the light. But the issue is that even prior to the release of White Veil, there were a ton of back row removal options that allowed you to deploy your opponent's threats that were just way easier to use, as instead of being destroyed an opponent's monster by battle, these cards could deal with a bunch of back row for the low cost of a normal summon, a discard, or sometimes even no cost at all. So White Veil was redundant even before it was released, as less awkward and stronger cards were already available. Still, if you want to shine as bright as Chaz did, you can at least rely on the power of one of his latest Armed Dragon monsters, Armed Dragon Level 10 White, a monster that's actually capable of searching White Veil. But for now, it's probably a good thing this Society of Lysis 8 card is more of a novelty than a genuine threat, as otherwise your locals might be getting a bright makeover. Burn into number 3 is Thonian Polymer, a part of Chaz's initial Thonian strategy that almost allowed him to defeat his longtime rival. And that's because Polymer actually counters Jaden's biggest strength, Fusion Summoning, as whenever an opponent Fusion Summons a monster, you can activate Thonian Polymer by tributing one monster in order to take control of their Fusion Monster permanently. This made it one of Chaz's best anti-Jaden options, as no matter how he combined his heroes, Thonian Polymer gave Chaz a way to bring out their dark side. And we got to see this during Chaz and Jaden's very first duel, where Chaz stole Jaden's Flame Wingman, a play that put him at a huge advantage. But Polymer's most important moment in the series was actually when it wasn't used at all in Jaden and Chaz's final face-off, where Chaz was actually dueling in Aster's place to fulfill his obligation to a TV producer. But this particular producer had a terrible dueling philosophy, as he believed that making an entertaining duel was much more important than two duelists trying their hardest. And so forced Chaz into a costume and made him humiliate himself for laughs under the new title of Ojaman Jome. This culminated in Jaden and Chaz's final duel, where the hero summoned out his favorite card, Flame Wingman. Chaz was prepared and had Thonian Polymer sent, which would have let him steal Flame Wingman and win the duel. But before he could activate the card, the producer whispered to him and told him he had to lose in an embarrassing way. So Thonian Polymer essentially represented Chaz's pride as a duelist. He could either activate the card to defeat Jaden and hold on to that pride, or he could swallow it for the sake of entertainment. And so Chaz activated Ojama Trio. To get laughs out of the audience, this won him the TV producer's favor, but made Jaden disappointed in him. And what's worse is that Aster had staked his future as a pro duelist on Chaz's win, so even though Chaz was trying to help Aster, he almost ruined his career. Thankfully, after this duel, the TV producer was exposed as a criminal that stole the ultimate D-card, so Aster could return to pro dueling and Chaz was able to shed his Ojama costume and even win his next duel against Aster, showcasing that he never needed to rely on silly gimmicks to be a pro duelist, he just needed his pride. Unfortunately though, Thonian Polymer isn't likely to give you the same competitive edge against a pro duelist in the TCG. Stealing an opponent's fusion monster permanently is actually a pretty strong effect, and well worth the cost of a tribute. But it's an incredibly specific counter. Meanwhile, a card like Enemy Controller with a similar cost and effect can be used against virtually every strategy. And even with the niche of countering fusions, there are a ton of cards that do a way better job. And so it's definitely a shame that the representation of Chaz's Pride, a card that would have beaten Jade and Yuki, isn't really that amazing in the real game. So if you want to hold onto your pride like Chaz, there are better options out there. Armed and ready at number two are the Armed Dragon Monsters from level three all the way up to level 10. These monsters are all level monsters and so go upgrade into their higher levels whenever a specific condition is met. The first Armored Dragon is level 3, which can easily be brought out to the field whose only effect is to summon an Armed Dragon level 5 during the standby phase by sending it to the graveyard. Armed Dragon level 5 has an effect upgrade, where during the end phase it can be leveled up to level 7 during the turn where it destroyed a monster by battle. However, it also has an effect to send a monster from your hand to the graveyard to destroy a monster in the field with an attack less than or equal to the monster sent. And level 5's upgrades have stronger variants of this effect. With level 7, you get to destroy all monsters your opponent controls with attack less than or equal to the monster you sent, while level 10 can use any card as cost and can destroy all face-up monsters no matter their attack stat. And when these dragons were all used in tandem, they were a deadly part of Chaz's arsenal, allowing him to easily snowball from weak level 3s all the way up into the dominant level 10s. And in a way, that makes the armed dragons the perfect representation of Chaz as they start off as weak monsters that, if given the chance to grow, can go on to do extraordinary things. Funnily enough though, the Armed Dragons weren't originally part of Chaz's deck. They were actually awarded to him when he became North Academy's number one student, so that he'd have an extra boost in power against Jade and Yuki in the inter-school duel. But make no mistake, Chaz wasn't just gifted these cards. He'd earned them by fighting every single North Academy student, working his way up from the bottom with a deck made up of scraps. This victory earned him a lot, the Armed Dragon cards and the right to face off against Jade and Yuki, but it also earned him the favor of North Academy students who came up with a chant to support their new king. 
In the English version, this chant is the iconic Chaz It Up. While the Japanese anime, the chant was 1, 10, 1000, 1000, Manjom Thunder. And given that the armed dragons are analogous to Chaz's journey, it only makes sense for them to also have retrains of each armed dragon to include thunder within their name. But even with this new title, none of the original armed dragons or their thunder counterparts have ever been too successful, because of their unfortunate reliance on needing to level up. This made it so that you had to go out of your way to keep your weaker armored dragons on the field so that you could eventually upgrade them and make them stronger. But these upgraded forms were incredibly bricky and were never worth the payoff. Because while a field wipe is an amazing effect to have, reaching even level 7 requires a ton of resources and time investment. The modern Thunder Monsters do a good job of making the level up mechanic easier to give, and stronger payoffs, but outside of brief experimentation in Dragon Link, the strategy hasn't been able to keep up with the modern game. However, there is one armed dragon that stands above the rest and terrorized the game for years, Dark Armed Dragon. Dark Arm was a boss monster amongst boss monsters, thanks to its easy summoning condition and absurd removal effect, which lets you banish a dark monster from your graveyard to target and destroy any card in the field, which had no once per turn. So a single Dark Arm could wipe away most of a field and was so strong that one of Yu-Gi-Oh's first tier 0 formats was consolidated around the deck that could use Dark Arm to its full potential, Teladad. So while it's definitely a shame that neither the original or Thunder versions of the Armed Dragons, Chaz's growth as a duelist is well represented in Dark Armed. But there's a trio of monsters that represent Chaz's journey even better than the Armed Dragons. And budding into number one is Ojama Yellow, the leader of the Ojama Trio and Chaz Princeton's ace monster. For an ace card though, Ojama Yellow is extraordinarily weak with zero attack and 1000 defense. But supposedly, the Ojamas contain a hidden power. As if the Ojama trio ever reunited, something is said to happen. Now at first glance, Ojama Yellow seems like an unfitting ace for a powerful duelist like the Chaz. And initially, he would have agreed. As even with the spirit of Ojama Yellow revealing itself to him and the promise that the card would help him grow stronger, he saw it as a zero attack trash that only served to annoy him. He was correct, really correct, as Ojama Yellow clearly aggravated him as both a monster and as a dual spirit partner, and grew even more annoyed after he reunited with the Ojama Trio, as instead of just dealing with one cowardly and weak spirit, he had to deal with three. But Chaz seemed to have some strange affinity for his trash, because no matter how much the Ojama Trio irritated him, they were a mainstay of his strategy because his philosophy on the cards had shifted. They were still garbage to him, but they were garbage that served as testaments to his strength as a duelist as only someone as intelligent and as bold as him would be able to reveal the hidden strength of an Ojama. And this wasn't just his arrogance, as Chaz showed an incredible proficiency when using the Ojama trio, and even managed to reveal the hidden power their flavor text described, not only with the strength of Ojama Delta Hurricane, but also by combining them to form Ojama Kink, who could be a pretty impressive beat stick when paired with Oja Muscle. In fact, no matter how much Chaz seemed to dismay the thought of his dual spirits, his confidence bloomed whenever he used them, as if he were proud of them, because in a way, Chaz saw a lot of himself within these rejects, because like him, they were mocked and treated as failures. So any win they got was proof that even Trash can be strong. And with Ojama Yellow by his side, he achieved his greatest victory of the series against Aster Phoenix, with Chaz's trust and pride in Yellow being put on full display as his ace monsters delivered the final blow. The only sad part about this movement was that Chaz was right. Only someone like him was capable of going pro with Ojamas, as in the TCG, the deck is terrible. Now, there are a ton of creative and interesting ways to unlock the hidden power contained with the Ojama strategy, from its synergy to ABC Dragon Buster, to a surprisingly effectiveness at link climbing, to even blocking your opponent's zone so they can't be used at all. But the main issue with most Ojama decks is that they are all reliant on you playing the original three Ojama monsters, who, despite how Chaz used them, are all terrible vanilla monsters that are incredibly bricky and do virtually nothing on their own for the most part, are treated as a joke by both competitive and casual players alike. In fact, the Ojama trio are so terrible that the only way they've seen play is when they were given to your opponent through the effect of Ojama trio, a trap card that can clog up your opponent's monster zones with worthless tokens that end up burning an opponent each time they're destroyed, and once had the potential to stop an opponent from playing entirely, upholding the Ojama's annoying nature. But even Ojama Trio fell from grace in the modern day, because while it did have a ton of synergy with Mystic Mind decks, once Mind was banned, there was no reason for any deck to play Trio, as it just gave your opponent three monsters they could use for a free Link monster. So, as it currently stands, the Ojamas really do live up to how they were portrayed in the anime. They're annoying, useless, and downright ugly. To the point where their only real success was being so bad that it was better to give your opponent an Ojama rather than keeping them on your own field. 
and pretty much no duelist has ever been able to make the deck work. No duelist except the chance, as the Ojamas embody his will to climb up from the bottom of the barrel, his intelligence as a duelist to win with such worthless cards, and his pride because no matter how worthless these cards are, he is always going to be proud of his particular trio. And that's the list. If you think we missed any cards or have any ideas for characters we should cover next, please let us know down in the comments below. And remember to like the video, subscribe if you want to keep up to date with any future lists, and thanks for watching.